sorrow I felt, but Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, He set me free, He set me free, yes, He set me free, He broke the bonds of prison for me, I'm glory bound my Jesus to see, for glory to God, He set me free. Climbing higher each day, darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground, and glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see for glory to God. He set me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound. Not of the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working and praying to and glory to God. I'm going through. He set me free. He set me free, He broke the bonds of prison for me, I'm glory bound my Jesus to see, for glory to God, He set me free. Well, good morning. We would like to welcome you this morning to Thompsonville First Baptist Church, right from the comfort of your own home. But we are so glad that you have joined us this morning, and we pray that this will be a truly blessed experience for you. One thing I want to say before we get going, with all of the struggles and the trials that we've got going around in our world the last couple of weeks and months, just hold on and stay strong. Do not lose faith. Do not lose hope. It's not time to throw in the towel. It's time to get going, because uh, the Lord and Savior who saved each and every one of us uh, he has this firmly in his hand. He has the plan. He knows the beginning, and he knows the end. So if we hold true to those uh, truths that he's given us, he will take care of us. So uh, stay strong and uh, keep on keeping on, and uh, we'll keep coming to you each and every week until this all passes, and then we'll once again be together. It's great to uh, have all of you joining us this morning. Uh, let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer, and then we'll get the service started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity that we have to uh, come to you once again, Lord. We just uh, pour ourselves out to you, Lord. Uh, we just ask that you would uh, comfort us, Lord, that you would keep us, watch us over us, and protect us, Lord. And we just pray that um, with everything going on, Lord, that we would be bright, shining lights for your kingdom, Lord that we would, uh, in these dark days that we're walking through right now, Lord, that we would uh, be boldly proclaiming your name, Lord, boldly proclaiming the news um, and the truths of your word, Lord. I just pray that we would be mighty witnesses for you uh, in the times that we're in, Lord. And we know that you have the plan, we trust you, and we know that you have it all uh, under control, Lord. And just uh, be with this service, Lord. I pray that it would touch hearts, Lord. I pray that... Uh, uh, minds would be open and um, accepting, Lord, and I just pray that uh, if there's anybody that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, that they would make that all-important choice, Lord, to uh, to put you first and center in their lives, Lord. Just uh, guide and watch over us through the rest of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you dear Lord thank you so much for your grace and your mercy Lord just We uh, so don't deserve it, but you so willingly and so graciously supply it to us each and every day, Lord. And I just pray we would come broken before your throne, Lord, and just um, you pour your words out into our heart, Lord, and we just take those and apply them to our lives. Lord, just uh, be with Brother Toby as he brings this message, Lord. I just pray that it would be uh, uh, accepted, and Lord, that our minds would be open, our hearts would be open, Lord, and we would want to hear from you, Lord, and take your word and be not just hearers of it, but doers of your word, Lord. Just uh, just uh, guide and watch over us we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Appreciate the praise team doing this and uh, coming up here each week to work and prepare the uh, music, and we hope it's a blessing to you. <clears throat> we just want to remind you, uh, this week we're going to be feeding somewhere around 30 or so individuals, and uh, we're doing that from our church, and we're hopefully going to be doing that again next Sunday, and uh, then we're going to be doing that also during spring break, uh, where we'll be uh, helping the school where they're not able to uh, feed during that week, that our church is going to go ahead and help feed those students that need help, and uh, in mentioning that, we need help. We need to make sure uh, it's hard to give our tithes when we're not in this place, when we're not in the church. That really is difficult, uh, because we have to really make a conscious effort, because we're usually here on Sundays, and we make that check ahead of time, and then we can drop it in the plate. But when we're not here, uh, it makes it more difficult. But that even should make it even more of a time of worship, that uh, we make a conscious effort to say, God, thank you for what you've blessed us with. And we give that tenth as recognition that God has given us all these things. So we want to really encourage you to do that. We want to continue to be able to minister to Thompsonville in this area, in this region, um, even while we're not able to gather. But the only way we can do that is if we continue to give our tithes and offerings. So if you could make an effort to do that, if it's uh, coming up here during the week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when uh, Kendall is up here or any other time, just make an effort, maybe drop it off at Deacon's or one of our houses. We could uh, make every effort to help you do that. And that is an, uh, an opportunity for us to worship. And that is an expression of our love for God and our trust in Him. And so we want to encourage you to do that, especially with Annie Armstrong coming up. Uh, And that's harder for us to reach that goal, but we have a goal for that. So even be praying about that as we try to support not just our own ministries here, but ministries around the world and ministries around the United States. So we want to encourage you to give. And speaking of that, this week, we want to talk about the one who's given the most, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Today I have a message entitled, Engraved. And I want to read from Isaiah chapter 49 to start out. Isaiah 49, starting with verse 14 and going through 16. But it says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she would have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. And I want to focus especially on verse 16 this morning. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. To behold means to watch or to consider or to gaze intensely at something. It means that you give your full attention because something of great importance is about to be revealed. And during this time of pandemic that we are in, it's really easy for us to to give our full attention to COVID-19 or to give our full focus to the inconvenience of stay in place or to the loss of income or to uh, the potential loss of retirement funds as the stock market continues to fluctuate. Or we may be tempted to focus our attention on the fact that schools are closed and now we are having to spend more time with our children than we have since they were born. And now we're struggling going, man, I don't know. You know, I saw a a meme of a, a, a mom going out scraping the off the back of her bumper, a sticker that said, my son is an honor child, is an honor student, you know, and now she's got to spend a week with him, she's going, I don't know about this, all right, so now she takes it off. And we focus on these type of things, or maybe we focus on the media and all the negative news that is continuing to come out, and we give our full focus and attention to those things. But for the Christian, 
when we hear the word behold in Scripture, it is a call for us to look intently upon our God because he is the one about to lift a spiritual veil from our eyes that has darkened our understanding up to this point. And Jesus, if we remember, he often said, for him who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now we have ears. Was he talking about our physical ears? No, he's talking about a spiritual heart and a spiritual ability to understand what he was about to say. And after the resurrection, Jesus approached two of his followers who had witnessed his crucifixion, and they knew that he had been dead, but he rose from the dead, and they were on their way to Emmaus. And Jesus is walking with him, with these two individuals, but they don't recognize who he is. And even after he explained to them the things that concerning himself and what the scriptures had taught, they still didn't understand. And this should serve as a reminder for us that it's not enough for just for us to do Bible study if we want to truly have spiritual understanding. Because it was only later that evening as Jesus sat down to have a meal with them that their eyes were opened and they recognized who he truly was. You see, we gain spiritual understanding as we commune with the person of the Lord Jesus. We can't understand the word of God unless we have fellowship with the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word that became flesh. And still later that night, the two followers of Jesus who had had their their understanding opened, went back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 disciples, and they began to tell them what had just happened. And it says that while they were telling these things to the disciples, that Jesus himself stood in their midst. And the disciples were frightened. They were scared. But Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then it says, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. You see, we have to have God open our minds. The Holy Spirit must open our minds to understand scriptures. Jesus himself must give us spiritual understanding. And that can only happen as we spend time with him. In the book of Revelation, seven times Jesus says to the churches, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's what we need to be praying during this time. Spirit, give us understanding. Spirit, open our minds to understand. Spirit, open our souls to receive from you what you have for us. From the beginning of time to the end of time, it is only a supernatural revelation that reveals to us the very wisdom of God. It's a mystery that could not be understood unless the Lord God allowed us to see it. It's a mystery until it's revealed from on high. And so it is that the Lord says to his children, even in this generation... Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. He made this statement to a, to, a, to a nation that had forgotten him. The nation of Israel had forgotten what God had done for them. And I believe he says this to the world today. As the world is facing this pandemic, God is saying, I have not forgotten you. And you may think that God has forgotten. But he says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And this great statement of faithfulness on God's part was preceded by a great statement of doubt and unbelief on the part of his own children. God says, behold. It means to look at with wonder or even bewilderment. And part of the wonder of verse 16 is the grieving statement of the children of God in verse 14 in Isaiah 49 where they say, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. But how many of us have been there? Have you ever been there? Have you ever prayed and wondered, is God listening? Is he even there? Are my prayers just bouncing off the ceiling and coming back? Does God even hear? Does he even care? Have you ever had such dire circumstances come into your life that you feel like there's no hope or you wonder, where is God? Have you ever questioned why a good God would allow allow bad things to happen? Or have you ever questioned why a good God would allow bad things to happen to good people?
of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. You see, Isaiah was brokenhearted. He was crying out in despair. But as the angels watched from heaven and they watched from the throne room of God, they worshipped him because they understood he is holy. The angels never doubted God was still seated on the throne. But sometimes we doubt. Revelation 4.8 John saw this and he said, the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. He has always been on his throne. He always will be on his throne. And the angels know that. They don't doubt that. The angels sing it loudly no matter how bad circumstances are on earth or even how bad it looks in the spiritual realm. The angels know he is holy and he's seated on his throne forever. In Hebrews 1, 3 through 7, talking about Jesus, it says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. Understand, just by the word of his power, Jesus upholds all things, including us in this time of tribulation. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And I love that, that God describes his angels as ministers of fire. Well, who are they ministering to? In verse 14, it tells us in Hebrews 1, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Man, the angels of God who see his face every single day, they uphold him, they glorify him, they cry out, Holy is the one who is seated on his throne for now, from time began, and from now till time ends. He is seated on his throne, he is there. They never doubt God. These angels don't doubt him, but they are amazed. They're amazed to such a rebellious creation, such as you and I are, you know, that we have, we're so fickle in our ways, but it says that, that we as that rebellious creation has found a near place to the heart of the one who is so holy. And they faithfully, the angels faithfully serve that holy one, and they prove it each day as they minister to us, you and I, even though we are rebellious so many times, and we doubt God so many times. You see, the angels never doubt God. And they continue to minister even to us, ministers of fire and ministers of flame for us on our behalf, for God in his behalf. And you see, there's another thing I know is demons don't doubt God. Mark 1, 23 through 24 says, Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You see, out of all of God's creation, we humans alone, out of all the beings that God has fashioned in his, in his image, dishonor him with unbelief and tarnish his honor by mistrust. So many times we do that. But still God cries out, behold. His divine mind seems to be amazed at how easily we forget his great mercy. He sees all of our fears. He sees everything that is coming against us. And he wonders why we would ever doubt him to come through on our behalf. What could be more astounding than the unnecessary doubts and fears of God's favored people? And, and God knows that he pleads with us to bring all of our anxieties to him because he cares for us. And he never mocks our fear. He never uh, questions that. What he just says is this. He says, bring your fears to me. What he wonders is why we hold on to them and why we cling to them. And he says, how could I forget you when I've engraved you on the palms of my hands? That's what he questions. He doesn't question that we're going to have fears and troubles and pain in this world and even death and sorrow. But what he says is, why do we hold on to that so tightly? 
and not hold on so tightly to him. He makes this statement to a forgetful world to remind them of his amazing faithfulness, and God is faithful. Because he says, behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. Just how faithful is God? He says, behold, that word is intended to excite admiration. It's a call to marvel. Heaven and earth are rightly astonished that rebels like us would somehow obtain such a great nearness to the heart of infinite love as to be engraved on the palms of his hands. In the midst of our doubts, God calls us to gaze intently at his hands. He says, look at my hands. There was a moment after the resurrection of Christ that the disciples began to doubt that, that he had really risen from the dead. And we all know doubting Thomas, the disciple doubting Thomas, he had some great doubts. But to remove his doubts, here's what Jesus said. He said, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Hey, if you have any doubts about the love of God, you don't have to look any further than his hands. That they've been pierced. They've been engraved. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were doing the worst things that we could ever possibly imagine that we would ever do, if we would ever look back over our past and we'd look at the most terrible things we've ever done, we could go and say that moment was the moment that Jesus died for me to prove that he loved me. And he loves you. And he loves each one of us. He says, look at my hands. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And I love this. It doesn't say, I've engraved your name. He's not looking there and seeing our names. He's not looking and seeing there's Toby, there's Becky, there's Roger, there's Jimmy. He's not saying any of those things. He is saying this. He's saying, uh, the name is certainly there, but it's not that. He says, I have engraved you. And think about what this includes. I've engraved your person. I've engraved your image. I've engraved your condition. I've engraved your circumstances. I've engraved your sins, your temptations, your weaknesses, your wants, your works. I've engraved you. Everything about you, all that concerns you, I've put every bit of you here in my hands. And back on March 1st, when I first preached here, when my family was here and we joined the church, I preached a message on Psalm 139, one of my favorite uh, passages in all of Scripture. And I just want to remind you of what that says. Psalm 139, where David said, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Let us understand my thought from afar. Let us scrutinize my path and my lying down and are instantly acquainted with all my ways. And that word scrutinize is from the Latin, which means trash and rags. It gives reference to a careful search, even including trash and rags. He knows the trash we leave behind. He knows the trash we'll be tempted to pick up along the way. And he has looked at that carefully. He has scrutinized our path. He knows our lying down. He knows every time we've gotten off the straight and narrow path to camp somewhere that we shouldn't have camped, he knows what sins we've lingered in and the slop that we've wallowed in. He knows every time we sit down and every time we stand up. He has searched the path that I've been on. He knows the path that I am on right now and the path that I will soon be on. It says he is intimately acquainted. He is inter intimately acquainted with our innermost confidential ways. He knows our deepest, darkest secrets. He knows our hurts that no one else knows. And since he knows the smallest, most intimate details of our lives, it's not a difficult thing for God to cause all things to work together for good. To those who love him, and those who are called according to his purpose. See, he watches everything. He knows it all. And David says, even before the word of my tongue, behold, the Lord, that's the Lord. That thou hast enclosed me behind him before and laid the hand upon me. He said, Lord, you know what I think, 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 Form an inward heart. That is we me for mother's womb. I will thank to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful works, and my soul knows it very well. I frame secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not even one of them. Understand, he has written every one of your days, not years, but days. He knows how long we will live, and the time is calculated down to the macro second. He knows everything. And then David goes on, he says, How precious are thy thoughts to me, God. How precious is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I am awake, I am still with thee. David goes, he says, Man, when I go to bed at night, God, you're thinking about me. And he said, When I wake up in the morning, I find you're still thinking about me. 
And he said, your thoughts are greater than the sands of the sea. If I would try to count all the pebbles of sand in the world, they would not even come close. Your thoughts would outnumber that in just the night that you speak of me. His thoughts never leave us. In verses 13 through 15, God was thinking of us before we were born. In verse 8, it says, God thinks about us even after we die. God is still thinking of Adam, the first man that was ever created. And he's already thinking of the last child that's ever going to be born. And his mind has not stopped thinking of every person that has lived or will live between Adam and the last baby to be born. And even though his mind continues to dwell on the hundreds of billions of people who will ever inhabit this earth, Matthew 10, 30 says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And he says in Psalm 56, you have put my tears in your bottle. And then in Matthew 10, 29, he says, not one sparrow falls to the ground apart from God's knowledge. You understand that God has the amazing ability to think about you. He numbers the hairs on your head. He bottles the tears that we cry. And still, he does that with every single person that has ever lived or ever will live. And his minds never leave us, even before we are born or even after we die. His thoughts never leave one single person that has ever walked this face of this earth or ever will. He is that much in love with us. God loves you, and that should give us reason to trust him. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, we don't know what should have our greatest wonder. The faithfulness of God or the unbelief of his people. He keeps his promise a thousand times, yet the next trial makes us doubt him. He never fails. He is never a dry well. He is never like a setting sun or a passing meteor or a dissipating fog, and yet we are as continually bothered by anxiety, suspicions, and fears as if God were a mirage in the desert. And God is no mirage. He says to this world, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. So we know this is forever. Engraved is something that is permanent. You can't get it off. And I think about uh, those that came out of the concentration camps during World War II, those Jewish individuals who had numbers carved in their hands or tattooed and they are there even till the day they die. But God has engraved us with great permanence upon his hands. He loves us so much. His love is forever. In Deuteronomy 33, 27, Moses said this, his everlasting arms are under you. God is an everlasting God, and he himself is our support at all times, especially when we're sinking down or deep in trouble. I mean, think about this. I know, you know, I, the times that I've sunk down in my sins and my temptations. Hebrews 7.25 says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And understand this, no matter how deep into sin that we may sink, he is able to save to the uttermost. And when you're at your worst, remember, he descended to the depths of sin, to the uttermost of evil, and he has won. His everlasting arms are under you. And maybe we're sinking under the stress of life, especially with everything that's going on. Jesus said this, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're sinking under the stress of life, under know this, uh, stress of life, know this, his everlasting arms are under you. And maybe it's your health, especially with this that's going on in our nation right now. Jeremiah said this in Lamentations 3. He said, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In Exodus 15, 26, Moses, God had told Moses, Moses this. He said, I am the Lord, your healer. His everlasting arms are under you even when your health fails. Or maybe it's just depression or some inner turmoil is going on in your life. And we all struggle with that at times. In Luke 4, Jesus said this. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. You see, even in the midst of depression, when our minds are weighing heavy and drawing us down and we feel like our souls just cannot recover, his, loving, his everlasting arms are still under you. And maybe it's just the opportunity of ministry or godly living and how that can draw the power out of us and it drains us so many times. But 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul said this, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I love Acts 1.8. Jesus told him, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. I'm so thankful that it is not in our power that we minister. It's not in our power that we try to live godly lives. He empowers us by his spirit to live the life that he's called us to live. Second Peter 1.3, Peter said, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence, Jesus empowers us to live a godly life and to live it to such a place to, that is at a match with his glory and his excellence because we glorify him when we are in his power filled with his Holy Spirit. His everlasting arms are under you to live the godly life and to minister to those who are hurting. And maybe it's financial problems. We know that now as so many things are going on, financial problems can be a, just draining to us. But Philippians 4.19, Paul said this, My God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. His everlasting arms are under you even when you struggle financially. And maybe our greatest enemy, which we know that the Bible says is death. Maybe that's your fear. John 10, 27 through 29, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And this assurance of support is this. It's a, it's a comfort to any Christian who is earnestly weary in the service of God. It implies a promise of strength for each day, grace for each need, power for each duty. And even further, the promise still holds when death comes. And when we stand in the midst of the Jordan, we'll be able to say, say with David, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. We will descend into the grave, but we can go no lower. The eternal arms prevent our falling any further, and they lift us into the presence of God Almighty, into the one who loved us even unto death. His everlasting arms are under you, even when we face death. I think about these things, I look at this, and I was thinking back today, uh, as I've been doing student ministry for so long, and I had a student write a letter one time, just a couple years ago, and, uh, and she had just really seen God do some great things, and she said this, she said, a couple years ago I prayed for God to tell me something. I prayed and asked him constantly, and after a few months, which felt like a few years at the time, he answered me. He gave me a glimpse of what that answer would look like in the future. Then, without warning, he took it away. I was confused and upset. I asked myself, why would he do that? I thought he wanted that for me. I thought that's what he planned. I thought that's what he promised. But it's been a good amount of time since all that happened, and you would think that by now I would at least feel better about everything that happened and would have moved on from it to a certain degree. But no. See, God made a promise to me, and because I've known him for quite a while, I've learned that he keeps his promises, all of his promises, the big ones, the little ones, the in-between ones, all of them. Psalm 1830 says, God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. Lately, though, I've been having a really hard time waiting for God to fulfill his promise and seeing fruit in the work I know he's doing in the midst of all of this. I've been cynical, envious of others getting what I wanted, depressed, you name it. But after multiple long talks with my best friends and starting a book I highly recommend called When God Says Wait, I learned and realized that it's not about the waiting. God doesn't say to himself, I'm going to make this beloved child of mine go through something unbearably hard for a designated amount of time just because. And then maybe, maybe not, give them what they ask for. He doesn't put us in the position of waiting just for the sake of waiting. He has a purpose for this in every season that we go through. It's not about the waiting. It's about how we react, react to what happens while we're waiting. It's about what we say and do when God says, you're not done yet, keep going. It's about us looking to God and saying, I can't do this alone. I don't know what your purpose is for allowing my being here. I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know what on earth I'm supposed to do, but I know that even when I can't see it or feel it, you are good. And your plan for me is so amazing. You think of things I would never think about. You see every side of every story. You see the past, the present, and the future. The end of this long and hard road I'm on right now is a memory to you. You've already been here, 
and there. You know how and when this turns out. So let your will be done. Your amazing will that right now doesn't seem so amazing. My will doesn't even hold a candle to yours. So take me and do whatever you want with me. I asked you to be my Savior, and in doing so, I asked you to be my Lord. And to be my Lord, I have to look to you in everything I do because I gave you full reign of my life. So let your will be done and turn mine to ashes. You are my God. You are my Lord. You are my Father. You know what's best for me, and you've proven that time and time again. You are faithful. You are always faithful. You always keep every promise you make. I have no reason to doubt you, no reason to not believe that no matter how long this journey is or how hard it gets, you are faithful, and your will will prevail. You will not fail me. Help me to not fail you. Waiting isn't about waiting. It's about what we do while we wait. And 99% of the time in my personal experiences, I have most definitely failed in that department. My faith has grown, my trust has withstood, but on the really hard days, I shatter worse than glass. So for everyone who is waiting on something, anything, don't let the struggle intimidate you. Sarah, Abraham, Hannah, Joseph, Noah, Moses, King David, they and so many others just in the Bible, not to mention the people that weren't even in the Bible, waited for months and years and decades for a hope, a dream, or even a promise from God himself that he would do something breathtakingly beautiful. If you're waiting for something, you're the farthest from alone. I know right now it's hard. It doesn't just seem hard. It is hard. So close your eyes, take a deep breath, and remember, God is faithful. And though you can't see it, he has a great purpose for this. And he's working on making you into the you you were made to be. Let him work and have hope. Because when you hope, time flies. Psalm, one, Psalm 27 says this, I remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And again in Psalm 38, David said this, All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. So, Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, Lord my God. If that's something that you can relate to and that's something you struggle with right now in this difficult times and these trying times, these anxious times. Know this, God is for you. God loves you. He cares for you. And all you have to do is turn to him. He has inscribed you and engraved you on his palm of his hands, on the palm of his hand. You are there forever. He has proven his love for you. Now he's just waiting for you to turn to him. Would you do that this morning? Father, I thank you for this great message that you've given us in your word. God, that we can trust you because you are so good. Lord, we go back and forth. We all do it. We're human. We're frail. You all, And that's the great thing is, is, Father, you understand that. You're mindful of our frail condition. But I'm so grateful also that through Jesus Christ, you've proven your love for us. Through the Spirit of God, through Holy Spirit, we have power to live the life you've called us to live. And Father, for those who do not know you and they're hearing this message this morning, or maybe they're listening to it sometime in their room. God, I pray that if they've never turned to you, that they would trust you with their whole life today and know that no matter how far they think they've sunk down and how deep they think they've gone and how far they think they are from you, you have gone farther and deeper and wider than anything they could have ever done. They can never escape your great love. I pray they would turn to you today. So Lord, may you be glorified and honored. Use this time in this nation Use this time in this world to show this, uh, this broken world that you love them so much that you died for them. You engraved them on your hand for all eternity. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. so much for joining us this morning. We, uh, we pray that you have been blessed. We uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to join us. And um, we're going to close out in a word of prayer. But before we pray, just remember, hold on, have faith in the one who holds tomorrow. Thank you for joining us again. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had to gather this morning in your house, Lord. I just uh, pray you would bless each one of us, Lord. I pray you would bless all the ones that's um, watching this, Lord, through whatever means they use in their homes, Lord. I just pray uh, you would keep a special hand of protection on them, Lord, and uh, hold their faith up, Lord, and, and keep them strong, Lord, and supported in this time, Lord, when many are struggling. And just pray that you would take the message that we've heard today and apply it to our lives, Lord, and that, that we would have revival, Lord. But that revival has to start within our own hearts, Lord. And I just pray you would start that among us. And then we would outwardly go and share that with everybody we come in contact with, Lord. Just um, keep us safe. Watch over us, Lord. And let us not forget that you hold everything, Lord. And our faith and trust is in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>